Jet Tila here, and today we're making one of my favorite dishes, General Tso's chicken. There's a lot of debate about authenticity. I just want you to throw that all away. I'm an Asian kid born in America, so you know what? This dish is authentic to me. It's one of those kind of super craveable dishes that has the sweet and the crunchy and the savory all in it, and it's really not that hard to make, so let's get into it. So there's gonna be a little bit of prep here, but the first thing you wanna do is get a fryer ready. So I've got oil in a Dutch oven. You're gonna preheat that to 375 degrees. So let's start with the chopping stuff. We're gonna do our vegetable prep first, then make our sauce, prep our chicken, and then we stir fry it all up. It's not as hard as you think. So knife work, let's get into it. I like to do all my knife work all at once, so it's kind of set and out of the way. All right, so I'm gonna start with the classic Chinese aromatics, ginger and garlic. And now, the final step is stir fry, which means like, don't get too delicate with it. I don't want you to overly finely mince anything, right? Just simply separate the garlic cloves. I love to cut off the end or the root side of the garlic so the garlic falls apart, and now I've got all the cloves that I need. And simply just uh, lay your knife on top of a clove and just lean. All right, you don't need to start getting crazy and smashing until you feel comfortable. And check it out, if, if you lean on the garlic with the root side off, the skin falls right out. It's kind of magical, okay? So I'm just gonna do one more here. Um, if you're comfortable after the lean, just give it a little tap. And with a little gentle tap, the garlic just releases because there's some natural garlic oil between the skin and the actual clove. So there you go. I like to kind of clean as I go because my wife gets super mad when I leave a giant pile of schmutz and craziness. So I'd like you to do the same. I have a dump bowl ready, have a moist towel so you can always kind of clean up as you go. With the garlic cloves already semi-smashed, I'm just gonna like flatten them all out because flat things cut very simply. And all I'm doing is doing a very kind of loose, maybe quarter inch pass. The wok's gonna get up to like 400 degrees, so don't over mince this. As you can see, they're not 100% even, but they're kind of in that smaller mince territory. And that's all you want for uh, most of your Chinese garlic. For any garlic that's gonna go into the wok right there. Garlic oil tends to get sticky, so a moist towel is gonna be your best friend. Anytime you feel like the board um, or your knife is getting a little sticky because of oils and stuff, just take a little moist towel and wipe them all down. All right, ginger, one of my favorite things, and this is where you can kind of show off to your friends. Take the big pieces of ginger and break them into smaller fingers, all right? That's the first step. Second step is to make sure you square the gingers off. Anything that's on your board that's round and will roll will probably end up getting you cut one day. So Tame it, make it behave. Take the, the edge of your knife and with slight pressure, I just want you to rotate your ginger around and that's how you easily peel. So again, flat cut and then really light pressure. I'm not even, I'm just literally leaning the blade against the ginger and that's how you peel your ginger. I'll do one more really, really quickly. But um, again, so square off ends and then bring the blade over. And I know those little nubs um, kind of stick out, just cut around them. But I know my grandma would be like, you're wasting ginger. But I'm like, yo grandma, ginger's cheap, it's plentiful. This isn't China in the 1940s, so don't freak out. Okay, cool. Again, I am a knife wiper because clean knives also keep you from getting cut. If you remember the Jet Tila rhyme, a tile becomes a slice, a slice becomes a dice. Yes, I have a whole room of people in here that are amazing. Hey guys, everybody please. A tile becomes a slice. A tile becomes a slice. A slice becomes a dice. I'm hearing you at home as well, okay? So um, get your tiles nice and thin. These are eighth inch tiles right here. And again, with a little practice, y'all, this is easy. This is not hard. So a tile now is going to become a slice, eighth inch again. And it doesn't have to be super even. I'm not going to pull a micrometer on it and freak out. But uh, as long as it's small, because uh, even the more even it is, the more even it's going to cook. And uh, you're going to get a beautiful kind of um, even things cook better. All right, and also even things look awesome in the pan. So now the slice becomes a dice. 
and I'm just going eighth inch. You know, you don't want to go too small. If you wanted to leave it kind of long, that's fine too. So I'm going to go with uh, minced here. All right, you guys hanging in there? So ginger garlic, let's move on to onion, shall we? Okay, onions. I need a half an onion for this recipe. I start all onions the same. I want you to take the top of an onion off and the bottom of the onion off. And I know people are gonna be like, but you need the bottom. Just calm down. I've cut a bazillion pounds of onions in my life. To get fast, you just, you need a half of the onion. And I peel my onions in the halves because they come off easier just like that, you see. Um, and even if I'm not using both halves of this onion, I'm gonna peel both and put one away because that should be your workflow in any kitchen. You do one thing all the way through and then you move on to the next thing. So flat part of the onion on the board, flat knife, just like a little table. I don't wanna go all the way through. Leave that connected right on the end there. And then large dice to me is about three quarter inch. So as you can see, I'm leaving the onion connected right on the end. Boom, there's one, and then I can go ahead and finish. There it is right there. So as for the uh, broccoli florets, uh, I'm cutting it off the entire kind of broccoli tree. I'm actually looking for where the florets are, start to kind of separate, and just one clean cut will kind of separate all the florets, just like that. Simply break your florets into reasonable pieces, kind of like, you know, maybe two inch, and if they're a lot larger, like this guy right here, just break them all up. Most of them are going to be perfect. I'll probably need to cut one big old tree in half or in quarters. That's totally okay. And that goes right into the bowl. So I just kind of like to cut where the branches start to separate, break them apart. Find one of those two big pieces and I'm good to go. You guys ever cook with Chef Mike? I think you do. When I was a kid in restaurants, we would use the microwave. But because we were a display open kitchen, we wouldn't want to say the word microwave in a pro kitchen. So it'd be like, yo, uh, Jet, can you uh, give this to Chef Mike for a minute? So Chef Mike is going to handle your broccoli. I want to cook the broccoli in a microwave for a few reasons, right? It's going to give me that perfect steam without bringing out a giant pot of water and having to flash boil and then and shock. Uh, Chef Mike's gonna take care of it a lot faster. Two to three tablespoons of water. Cover tightly to create some steam. And uh, let's give this to Chef Mike for two minutes. Last veg to cut is going to be scallions. You just want to run them underwater, drain them, and I like to line up all my scallions together root to root. Take off about a quarter inch above the root, turn over and uh, find where they all line up perfectly and then that's where you wanna make your cut. That'll go into our toss bin, which will be for stock or something. And you're not really done. If you see like loose leaves, just pull off any loose leaves. And that to me is a prep scallion. Whites or greens, what do we use? We use it all. It makes no sense to me to chuck any of it. So I like to actually make the cut uh, where the whites are whites and the greens are greens. What you're gonna do is something called bias slice. I just want you to angle the knife. So this is perpendicular. This is angled, and just so that just means bias cut, y'all. So just give me a nice bias cut. And uh, there's no difference in flavor, but man, does that look good. In restaurants, we call that perception of value, and that just means I can charge you more money when I send this to you. Uh, so the whites look like that, and I'll do the same thing with the greens. The whites are a little more pungent and spicy, and I want that, right? And the greens are a little more sweet and mild, and uh, it's nice to have that difference sometimes. Okay, scallions are done. I've cut everything that's vegetable first, and now I'm gonna move on to protein. Never go the other way because of cross-contamination. I have chicken thighs here. Now, these are super clean thighs. I'm okay with rinsing chicken thighs, and then what you always wanna do is take uh, clean paper towels. These are single use, and what you wanna do is just pat them down, and this gets thrown away. So these are just basically uh, deboned, skinless chicken thighs. And I wanna cut them into about 
three quarters to one inch cube. And we've all eaten kind of that general so's sweet and sour orange chicken. It's about a nugget. You have to account for the batter that you're gonna put on. That's gonna add some size. So I'll take a chicken thigh and I'll cut it in half first. So I'm cutting it in half and then I'm gonna go into a one inch dice because by the time it picks up the batter and fries into a crispy nugget, uh, it's gonna end up being two inches, right? Anything bigger than that just kinda eats awkwardly. I'm always thinking about what am I eating general sows with? First I'm eating with rice. And what utensils, usually a chopstick or a spoon, so it should fit on a fork or a spoon reasonably. And, and it's kind of pretty logical. I'm not a rocket scientist, I just cook food. So if it makes sense to me, it's gonna be easy for you to do. So half, remember, tile slice dice applies to everything in the world. I mean, it really is that simple. All right, so I've got all my thighs cut up. These need to be cooked into crispy nuggets. So a few things, let me wash hands first. Anytime I'm touching raw meat, I'm always gonna do a hand wash before I actually move on because I don't wanna I don't wanna cross contaminate anything. And notice I'm not touching that towel because it's still veggie clean. This is not. To get a really crispy nugget, you want something called tempera flour. And if you can't get it, no big deal. But this is all it is. Tempera flour is a part AP flour all-purpose flour. The other part is cornstarch or potato starch, because flour, all-purpose flour gives you structure, right? Um, potato starch gives you lightness. So when you bring those two together, you get the perfect fry coating. And sometimes you've got a little baking soda in there, because as you know, baking soda and liquid makes bubbles, and those bubbles uh, translate into crispy airiness. So I need two portions of tempura flour. One is for the dredge. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And the other one is for actually making a batter. So to make a batter, I need one portion's tempura flour to uh, the same portion of water. You wanna make a batter that is about pancake consistency, maybe like a little thinner, okay? So that's gonna be around one and a half times of the flour to one times the liquid, but you don't have to remember all these formulas. You know what pancake batter looks like. Just kind of shoot for that. If it's too thick, it's gonna get gloppy. Um, and if it's too thin, it's just gonna run right off the chicken and not give you a nice coating. So, so pancake batter, that looks a wee bit thick, so I'm just gonna go a little more. It is like slightly thinner pancake batter, just like that. All right, if you do want a really crispy coating, that <laughs> you can go thicker, but that makes me happy right there. Frying oil is at 375 degrees. I think that's an important temperature because most of the food that you put in the fryer comes from the refrigerator, 40 degrees. That meets 375 degree oil, and that's gonna get you down to that perfect fry area of 350, okay? So that's why I'm always starting a little higher. This is what the dredge means, all right? All dredging means is I need a little bit of a coating for these nuggets to hold on to the batter. This actually um, will, will kind of absorb all the excess liquid in the chicken and then get it ready to stick to the batter. So uh, that's dredged out. You wanna knock off any excess, dump it right into the batter. You don't want a thick coating, just a light little batter. And then I'm gonna just kinda of swirl it right in and let it start frying. A thermometer is absolutely crucial, right? I, I am the biggest proponent of thermometers because it's the only way that you're gonna know your temp is right on. And on top of that, you're gonna know if the oil is cooling down too fast because you're throwing in kind of cold nuggets in. So, um, so always monitor the thermometer. And again, start higher than you need to go. And I do this in batches. And it all depends on how much oil there is and how cold it is. But all you really need to worry about is uh, watching that thermometer. If it starts dropping down under 360, just stop. Let what's in the fryer just kind of keep going and allow that temperature to come back up. So I'm always watching my thermometer tell me, hey man, could I, could I go more? And if I can't go more, just hold. I like to swirl the chicken around because it gives you that kind of lacy, 
extra crispy batter and it helps thin out any really thick pieces. You ever like eat tempura? Some of the beauty of eating tempura are those kind of uneven lacy bits as, as you can kind of see right there. And if it starts to stick together in the pan, just feel free to break it up. You don't want this to cook in one giant chicken chunk because it kind of defeats the purpose. It'd be a cool dish, but it's not General Tso's for sure. So now that I've overwhelmed the pan just slightly, my temp is at about 360, I'm gonna hold it. That's about half the chicken. Now you don't wanna do it all at once because you gotta stay in the fry temperature zone, which is 350 and above, all right? Now, uh, intro new crucial cooking tool. This is called a spider. This is what you're gonna move the protein around. This is what you're gonna use to move the chicken around. You're gonna break up any kind of large lumps that it formed. And you wanna get rid of these extra crispy bits because these crispy bits are delicious, but if they go too long, they start to burn and they'll actually burn out your oil. And they'll actually make your food taste burn. So any large crispy bits like that, just get rid of. So as the temperature starts to climb again, uh, I'm gonna start with my next batch. And I'm looking for a golden brown color. Uh, the golden brown at the right temperature will basically tell you that the chicken is cooked through. Knock off the excess, give it a little swirl as it drops in. All I'm making sure to do is pull out the cooked pieces fish out all those nice crispy bits that are, are just batter only, and just allow everything to fry up at its own pace. So this is all the chicken I need for right now, but if you're making the entire recipe, please fry it all off, finish that, hit pause, and then we'll come back and then finish the rest of the dish. Bringing in the rack for the finished chicken. As you can see, this takes a minute, so don't rush this. You want nice kind of light golden brown nuggets, and you want all your chicken to be cooked through. So the first of the finished pieces are done, and I'm just gonna let them drain on a rack. Do not, do not just put them on a plate where they just re-soak up all that oil and get soggy. The whole idea is you want this very crispy. Don't stress out if they're not golden brown here. The beautiful sauce that I'm gonna show you how to make is really what's gonna make this dish pop. All right, so that's good. Let's go ahead and make this sauce. We've got a little bit of time. So I'm gonna bring this little burner up to low to medium, and I'm just gonna be adding my favorite Chinese ingredients, oyster sauce, probably the most important Chinese sauce. It is the umami bomb, right? Uh, soy sauce is not the king of the Chinese kitchen. It is actually oyster sauce because it has savoriness, it has sweetness, it has a really round, complete flavor. Poison sauce, which is a sweet sauce, just a little bit of that. Moving on, General Tso's is a spicy-ish dish. So I'm using chili garlic sauce here. Use chili garlic, do not use sriracha. Different country, different culture, different flavor profile, okay? I need a little water to thin this all out. Soy sauce as a backup player, as the salt here. And then the tanginess comes from white vinegar. General Tso's has that red color, and that actually comes from a drop of food coloring. Now, I've had colleagues and friends complain about red food coloring in here, but I tell you what, if you've eaten it in a restaurant, this is what brings the color. So look, dude, if you're gonna freak out about food color, just leave it out. But I'm here to show you how they do it in the restaurants, all right? So just a nice drop, if you want that, crazy nuclear magazine color, put another drop in there. Now I need to get the sweetness in here, and that comes from sugar. <laughs> it looks like a lot of sugar, but that is for one big old portion. And then to get the sauce to stick to the chicken in the pan, 
I need a cornstarch slurry. And all a slurry really means is um, mixing cornstarch into the water. Because if you were to put the cornstarch right in to this warm sauce, it would basically turn into one clump. So in order to introduce the cornstarch slowly, you want to add it to water first, which in Kitchen Talk is a slurry. The slurry helps to thicken the sauce into a beautiful glaze. And you want to continually whisk as you get the slurry in there. Because what's happening is, um, cornstarch activates with heat. At about 160 to 180 degrees, the cornstarch uh, molecules actually absorb like a sponge and it takes up all that sauce. So when you have this, we have a ton of cornstarch in there, this, 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 these sponges becomes a raft. Does that make sense? So the perfect amount of cornstarch makes a beautiful glaze. Too much cornstarch makes one basically a uh, clump of sauce. So, and again, to activate the cornstarch, I want to get this to 180 degrees. That just means when you start to see it simmer a little bit, it'll pull together into a sauce. As that cornstarch starts to activate and starts to thicken, I want to add just a hair of ginger and garlic because I want to leave the rest for the pan. And that's going to give you that beautiful kind of aromatic note. I'm watching this pan for the uh, simmering just to begin on the edges. Once that simmering starts, I want you to turn the heat down to maintain a low simmer. I don't want this into a rolling boil because I don't want to overactivate this cornstarch. All right, so my chicken pieces are perfect. Light golden, very firm and crispy. Let's give that a drain and then move it to the rack. and then turn your heat off right away. Sometimes people forget to turn that oil off and it starts to smoke and you're like, what is going on in my kitchen? So there it is, oil's off. Now I'm looking for the small bubbles here in my sauce and I want this sauce just to thicken into a nice glaze. I don't want this cornstarch to basically over thicken this sauce. I want the thickening to finish in the actual wok with all the rest of ingredients. So I want the cornstarch to slightly thicken the sauce into a glaze, but once I put it into the wok and it starts to boil aggressively, it's gonna turn into that beautiful kind of candy-ish coating for this chicken. So as you can see, I'm getting bubbles on the outside of the pan. And as those bubbles start to uh, happen, I wanna continue to stir that slurry into the sauce until I get a nice even kind of consistency or texture. So um, I'm looking for that kind of chefy coats the back of a spoon um, consistency and all that means is this. So I've got even bubbles. I'm gonna turn off the heat now. And if you run a wooden spoon through this very hot sauce, let it, give it a second to cool. Um, and when it's cool enough to touch, you just wanna run your finger and create a channel across that sauce. And if the sauce doesn't run across that channel, that's the perfect consistency. In French, we would call it nappe, but all it means is it's perfectly gonna coat the chicken nuggets. All right, we are ready to fire. I've got chicken ready to go. I've got all my veg happening. My sauce is good. Let's move over to the wok now. Let's check on Chef Mike to see if he's got the broccoli up. Oh yeah. Chef Mike actually did a nice job. When you're pulling steamed veg out of the microwave, don't lift up the plastic thusly to burn yourself and give you a facial. Grab the front, the 12 o'clock first, and pull away, and that's how you're not ever gonna hurt yourself. Oh, Mike, he did a phenomenal job. Excellent. So you see this excess liquid? We don't want that, so I'm gonna use the spider again and drain that off. It's a phenomenal technique because I don't need to shock the broccoli, right? Traditionally, I'd have to boil it, shock it in cold, drain it again. I've cooked it just enough so the carryover, meaning the cooling, is going to get that broccoli to that perfect kind of crispiness. So, so I am good to go. Um, is my mise en place set? Chicken check, veggies check, broccoli check, sauce check. All right, let's do this. Let's turn that wok up all the way. <laughs> Not very dramatic, is it? Boom, there it is. We always wanna get our wok up at full blast. A word on woks, well, this one is preheating. You don't need a wok 
to cook Asian food. I don't want you to be discouraged and go, dude, I don't have a wok, I can't do this. A Dutch oven is probably even better than a wok in an American kitchen, something like this. Enamelized cast iron, it's flat on the bottom so it doesn't roll around like that, and it's gonna retain heat beautifully. So again, don't freak out. I'm using my wok here, but you don't need one at home. All right, wok is ready to go. I want about two tablespoons of oil to start, and I'm gonna grab it right from the fryer. As you can see, there's no need of getting new oil. I can just use this frying oil to start. All right, if you're not using the wok oil, I want you to use any neutral high temperature oil, peanut, canola, vegetables, fine. Just stay away from olive oil for the Asian kitchen. Aromatics and vegetables. Let's go onions. And I'm doing the onions first here because I want them to kind of brown up on the edges. I mean, we all know the flavor of caramelized onions. It is delicious. That's gonna help cool the pan a little bit too. Now our aromatics. A little garlic, ginger. And your job is to just keep everything moving, all right? If you're hearing the sear and seeing smoke come off the wok, your temperature is always perfect. Broccoli. And now the pan's actually cooling a little bit. I'm gonna raise up the heat to stay ahead of it. Let me get this frying oil out of the way. Do this carefully. I'm ready for my chicken pieces. Let's get those in there. Now, because this sauce has sugar and slurry in it, it's not gonna sog out this chicken. Does that make sense? So if it was a water-based sauce, it would actually penetrate the coating, but because it's got sugar and it's got a nice amount of cornstarch, it's just gonna give it a nice coating. So all you're worrying about right now is tossing this to coat well. Let's add these dried chilies. And these are dried Thais or chili japonaise, anything you can get at the grocery store. I do like them stemless because you don't want those chili stems getting stuck in people's teeth. They're not really fun to eat. Don't put the chilies in too early because you're gonna make basically pepper spray and clear the room. So the chili should go in right at the end. So what I'm looking for is a perfect glaze. I'm looking for just enough sauce to kind of eat with the rice. The chicken has a ton of sauce on it, and if you find yourself needing a little more sauce because you have guests that love sauce, you could always put a little more in. And remember, because there's cornstarch and sugar in here, this isn't gonna sog out the dish. All right, let me clear up to plate. All right, plate of rice, my beauty plate, and here we go. I am salivating from all these smells. Now, I like serving a uh, little rice on the side. If you're doing like a family meal, uh, like uh, you know I do with my kids, I'll just put it over a beautiful bed of rice. And if you're not doing rice, brown rice, even cauliflower rice, this really is a phenomenal meal. And uh, it beats takeout. You don't need to go and order takeout. Make it at home. So finishing touches is a little garnish of scallion. And there you have it, my friends. General So's better than takeout in the comfort of your own home. Crispy, sweet, sour, savory. Mm. It takes me back to walking through Chinatown with my grandmother and getting a snack while buying groceries to make dinner. Probably one of the most iconic Chinese American dishes. So um, hope you guys enjoyed that. Thanks for cooking with me today. And we'll see you next time.